Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. We got a case going out of Oklahoma, and these two women, Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, are missing under extremely suspicious circumstances. And... Uh, Kansas moms, that's what they're being called, missing in Oklahoma since March 30th, 24. And the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation said Wednesday that based on information from the victim's vehicle, there's evidence of foul play. And that's the first time we're really hearing uh, much investigative information coming out of the police in Oklahoma, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, they're keeping this extremely tight-lipped. And in a case like this, I have a little bit of a problem with that uh, because I think in missing person cases, you really need to use the media and you really need to use the community uh, to help you, help the police try to solve this case. So we're going to do a dive into this very shortly. But first, folks, hang on to your hats, hang on to your seats. You're about to enter true crime from a police perspective. You're about to enter the off-the-cuff zone, the police off-the-cuff zone. There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped in Camden Ranch, Michael Biden. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. You guys all know I let the cat out of the bag because I had him on the screen before. I usually keep him off the screen. but So let me bring him right into the show. Joining me tonight, my co-host, professor of criminal justice at Albertus Magnus College in Connecticut, retired NYPD sergeant, attorney. Welcome to the show, Professor Mike Geary. Mike, welcome. Hey, Bill. Thank you for having me back again so quickly. Good to see you again. Hey, it's good to have you here. You know, I I tell a lot of people that when I go solo, it, it, it is really so hard. It's really hard to do this solo. And I mean, I know no one's going to shed any tears for me, but there's a lot of different things moving at once. So I really appreciate you coming on okay. as my co-host. Okay. You no, know, this case is, a, it's starting to get like national attention. I think for the first couple of days, people weren't paying that much attention, but we see these two women Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. And Veronica happens to be 27 years old and Jillian Kelly is 39. One of the things that's that's really jumped out at me early on was the fact that Veronica, uh, let me put their pictures up on the screen. Veronica Butler is involved in a uh, custody battle with her mother-in-law her paternal mother-in-law as well as her ex and apparently a lot of what we're finding out about it they're trying to keep it really secretive that she apparently could only visit her kids with supervised visits so that's an indication of something going wrong in the within the family as you know family court law governs and usually family court usually errs on the side of the mother yeah so something had to have happened that she's required to have like a uh be accompanied by say another adult to visit or to take custody of her children and the story goes on this day that she was supposed to pick up her, her children two two children and take them to a birthday party but so little is being confirmed uh by the oklahoma state bureau of investigation that this is all coming second, third hand from news sources. So we're not really sure what the heck is going on at this point. Your thoughts? 
Yeah, Billy, it's really strange because um, what you really see when you start uh, looking over the Internet for information on this case is like the wanted poster from, you know, not the wanted poster, you know, the, you know, help us uh, re rescue danger, you know, kind of thing, like, like a wanted poster. And you're not hearing a lot from statements from the Oklahoma, uh, you know, highway patrol, things like that, or even Kansas. And you just wonder because you know and i know we've done these missing persons cases in the past and bill too is you want everyone's help because you you want to spread the word that there are two missing ladies um and they we believe they may be in danger has anyone seen anything has anybody heard anything has anybody may have seen something a suspicious car anything if you met if even the slightest little bit of information please call a tip hotline you know, absolutely 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's kind of strange because there's, if the police only have so many eyes out there, but the public could be a force multiplier and can say, oh, I saw somebody driving down the street, uh, driving down the road uh, sometime around that time in the afternoon and they're driving really fast. And here's like maybe a, a description, you know, right. That, thank you. That's the poster that you see. And, and I, I don't know why they would do that. I'm sure they probably have a really good reason, but I can't figure out why, because we've always been taught that the public sometimes can be your force multiplier. They can be your best friend in a situation like this. You know, 100%, so Mike. So let me just go over the background of this. Two Kansas women were on their way to pick up the children to take them to a birthday party. However, somewhere on the journey, Veronica Butler, who's 27, and Jillian Kelly, 39, mysteriously vanished in a rural part of Texas County, Oklahoma. There's currently no sign of the women whatsoever. All that's left of their last known actions is an abandoned car that authorities believe they were traveling in. Now investigators are on the hunt to find answers on what happened to the women and what they have branded as a suspicious disappearance. The, the car, the car that the women were believed to be traveling in at the time that they went missing was found abandoned on the side of the road. The vehicle was found near Highway 95 and Road L in rural Texas County, Oklahoma, just south of Elkhart, Kansas, a rural community on the southern border of the state. At the time, the women were on their way to pick up children as the endangered missing advisory noticed by the Texas County Sheriff's Department says. However, they never made it to their pickup location. The women were reportedly going to pick up Miss Butler's children to attend a birthday party when they disappeared. Ms. Butler, uh, Tim Singer, Ms. Butler's pastor from Hugaton Assembly of God, told that to ABC News. An anonymous person close to Ms. Butler relayed similar information to KV2 and said they were supposed to pick the children up from Ava, Oklahoma. However, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation told the outlet that they could not confirm why and where these women were going and coming from as it is still under investigation. You know, that's one of the problems I have with this. Right. What, why all this secrecy? And again, one of the things that I found uh, disturbing about this is that they found something in the car that leads them to believe that there was foul play. So what did they find in the car? Was the car a crime scene? Was the blood in the car? Were the windows of the car broken? Uh, was there any signs that the car was inoperable? What made this? What made this foul play? And if that's the case, then why aren't they reaching out to the public for help? Because this is apparently a rural area where there's not much going on here, than you know, just fields and fields of I don't know what what they grow there, but that is what is tremendously disturbing that the, the, they they see something in the car that leads them to believe this foul play. However, they're not, they're not enlisting the help of the public. What does that lead you to think, Mike? Well, you know, the first thing I, it jumps out at me is that, thank goodness, the children seem to be okay because I think they're still with their uh, paternal grandmother. Um, and Because it looks like the, the uh, missing ladies, Butler and Kelly, never actually got to pick up the children. And so, therefore... We don't have four people missing. Um, we have two right now. And that's bad enough, but at least we know where the, that the children are safe. I'm thinking along the lines of you, um, either the police 
have found that there's maybe blood in the car, a smashed window, like there was some sort of struggle, or that maybe the car was forced off the road. Maybe there's some uh, marks on it, look like they were, they were sideswiped. Maybe they're forced off the road and abducted. You know, either scenario is there's no scenario that's good in this case. And I'm like you. I think there's something in there. And for whatever reason, still beyond me, I don't know why you wouldn't ask for help. They're not asking for help. But that car is absolutely a crime scene. And um, I'm hope, hoping that they are treating that with kid gloves and they are going over that with a fine tooth comb, looking for any DNA, anything they can get out of that car. But I agree with you. It's something that they are observing about that car or in that car or some characteristic of it is uh, sending off, um, you know, alarm bells. And the fact that they there is no sign of them, like they just disappeared off the face of the earth means that. To, to you and I, like they were at that point taken and possibly forcibly taken. And that's uh, what we got to work with right now. It's not a lot, but um, this does not look good. You know, Mike, what I think is that, as I say, in a lot of these investigations, we have to look into the victimology. Mm -hmm. And that means the study of the, back of the victim, the background of the victim. And here we have two victims on the screen, Jillian Kelly, who, for all reports, was just accompanying Veronica Butler to this meet, possibly as, you know, someone that would uh, be sort of the chaperone that allowed her to, to take custody of her children, even for a visit. And so Jillian Kel uh, Kelly, she's apparently a, a uh, religious a pastor's wife, and the, the picture I put on the screen before that's her with her family, a family of four kids. So this is really uh, a tragedy in, in, in that case. But yeah. I can't help but think that when we look at the victimology, we're going to find out that the answer is going to come back to someone in the family of uh, Veronica Butler. That's just my gut feeling. And the chance that this is a stranger encounter, that this is an abduction out on this road, I think with all these other circumstances, with the uh, custody battle, with the fact that um, Veronica Butler was not getting along with her paternal grandmother who had or her husband's, uh, I, it was the children's grandmother, uh, that she was not getting along with her. That, to me, that gives some reason that this is it could be an in-family situation here and that got real ugly and i'm just feeling that type of thing and i think it'll be found in the investigation in the victimology when you do a deep dive who could have been involved in this who could they as we spoke about off the air could she have corresponded by cell phone say with someone from the family to meet at a location to the exchange mm -hmm. of the kids and that's where this horrific whatever occurred happened because what makes me think also something bad happened is they locked down the school right that was right near where the car was found the police don't do that for no reason something happened and they're not telling us or the community what happened and i think that that's not right and i understand keeping an investigation close to the vest but you also have to protect the community and what her car looked like what did they find in that car is that car a crime scene i want to play a little bit of this from news nation car found abandoned ronica butler and jillian kelly were last seen on saturday butler's family revealing on social media the two were traveling together to oklahoma to pick up butler's children and there may have been a custody dispute involved new video of where their car was found abandoned near a school where butler graduated in 2015. we're now learning that school was on lockdown yesterday will limit visitation and lock classroom doors today joining us now is criminologist Dr. Debbie Goodman. Uh, Debbie, wonderful to have you here. So some experts speculating this could be now an abduction. The Endangered Missing Advisory says these women never made it to the pickup location, that their car was abandoned on the side of the road. What clues are you gleaning from that car left 
behind. What do you believe investigators are doing right now to track these women down? Certainly. Well, good afternoon, Kelly. Always a pleasure to join. You know, first we start with, with the numerics and the statistics, and it's not good, um, meaning that our Department of Justice, our National Institute of Justice reports that approximately 200,000 women and children go missing annually. And that number's alarmingly high. So I'm absolutely in agreement here that this is um, a, an issue of foul play. Now, we look at foul play, and there's many categories there. So what could potentially happen to two women driving and, and who may they have encountered? Well, unfortunately, it's quite likely of, of a potential for robbery, a kidnapping, um, you know, sex trafficking, human trafficking. So I know these are very deep, dark, and dramatic categories of crime, but it's just so irregular. I would absolutely not believe that this is a suicide or some kind of, you know, self-induced type of circumstance, but something has happened against um, Ms. Butler's and, you know, their will. They're, they're not with, you know, this wasn't planned or premeditated by them. So we have to continue with pretty much everybody and anybody who may have seen something, you know, to see something, say something, even if they think it's minor and minuscule, it's got to be reported. You know, and I want to talk about uh, this custody issue as well in just a moment. But the area where the car was found, it seems incredibly desolate from the images. Uh, what does that tell you about what may have happened here? Does it give you any insight uh, into what may have led to their disappearance? Absolutely. I think so, Kelly, because, again, even among criminals, they're looking for easy targets. They don't want to get caught. The fact that this really is not any type of populated, well-lit area, it's going to be even more challenging. You know, we're moving into day five here, so that's another concern. It's not just make-believe, but it's fact when investigators really hone in on the first 48 hours of an investigation that's always critical and pivotal in the safe return. But as the, you know, days and hours here tick by, we're... Um, you know, it's not in the positive zone, but again, there's hope. We have to remain hopeful that um, they will be safely returned. Certainly, always. Uh, you know, Dan Abrams, he was reporting last night that there was a report that noted these women were going to a supervised visit with one of the children. Uh, the details at this hour are a bit um, ambiguous, but you'd have to imagine investigators are looking into the details surrounding those relationships as well. Uh, what sort of conversations do you think are happening behind closed doors right now? Oh, absolutely. You're right on point. So even as a criminologist, what I like to look at first and foremost, Kelly, about how do we go about solving something like this? We really look at the victims themselves. So with whom did our women last interact? What are their relations? We can't assume anything, um, you know, as moms, as wives. But if there's any disharmony, any discord, that is going to be, you know, top of the list of, of with whom and the types of questionings that will be asked about relationships. People have motivations that, again, unfortunately are deep and dark, and sometimes the killing off of somebody becomes somebody else's uh, decision. Thank you. Uh, I think that um, Dr. Debbie is uh, right on point as far as the foul play. However, yeah. I don't see this as stranger foul play. I feel that this has something to do with the family. I feel that uh, something went wrong with the meat or it was a pre-planned meat. And that's where the dirty deed was done. And uh, look, the Oklahoma State Department of Investigation is saying there's foul play. Something in that car made them say there was foul play. Something in that car made them lock down a school that was close by there. Something in that car are making them consider this a crime scene. Something in that car are making them keep their mouths shut and not tell us anything. To me, if that was a stranger, they would be all over the state with flyers and, and be on television. We're looking for this. We're looking. They're not.
because I believe it's going to come back to that family. I believe someone in that family is involved in this. Yeah, Philly, it's really strange. You're right. If they thought that there was a madman on the loose, maybe someone who had escaped somewhere from some sort of prison and they're looking for him or someone they think was killed by a madman and they're on the loose running through Southern Kansas and, you know, Northern Oklahoma border, the area there and, you know, be on the lookout for this guy, you know, let everyone know all the sheriff's departments are going to know. Yeah. There's going to be an FBI going to help out with the drag net. I mean, you know, you just got the dogs out there. Uh, you'd lock down the school, you'd lock down everything, tell people, uh, you know, stay indoors. We're going to be going from house to house, you know, looking for this person that ain't happening. So you're right. There's something about that. Um, you know, it could be possibly that the, um, it, when the car, as you know, suggested, maybe there was a predetermined meeting, um, not at the house, maybe, uh, Butler and Kelly had had a conversation and they, instead of going to the house, their plans were made with someone from the family to bring the kids a little bit closer to Kansas so that Butler wouldn't have to go all the way into Oklahoma to her mother-in-law's house, former mother-in-law's house. Yeah, I think the answer is within the family. Um, the one thing that makes me wonder is why would you lock down the school? And the, the only thing I saw on the internet looking at this was a statement by like this, the, the school principal was that Miss Butler had actually uh, graduated there like uh, nine years ago um, and that that was like the relationship between, you know, her and, and that area. And it didn't seem to make like a lot of sense. It seemed like a really weird reason just because somebody's an alum of that high school that you would lock it down. Um, yeah, I, I want to know about that, too, because that is a really weird wrinkle that I can't see fitting into the puzzle of what's going on. But I think you're right. This is what's the motive here? Who would want? to hurt uh, one or both of these girls. Um, and Mike, me, when you yeah. see this flyer, endangered missing advisory, at risk missing persons, right. mm -hmm. something violent was found inside that car. So yeah. let's put two and two together. Uh, Veronica Butler was having a custody dispute. Mm -hmm. Apparently right. her ex-husband was a violent guy. You know, is, was he, is he out on the street? Where was he? But could he have set up the meeting? Because, look, she didn't have custody. Right. Apparently, either did he. The grandmother had custody right. of her children. So I think all of the, you know, it's, it's a shame we have to do an investigation within an investigation to find out what are the police thinking here? What is the investigation? So let's look at the investigation. Right away, we think cell phones. And yes, absolutely. this is a very rural area. Who knows where the hell the nearest cell site is? Yes, who knows how well a cell phone even? But how about within the cell phone? Of course, you get a search warrant, mm -hmm. text messages, calls going back and forth. Could they have made a back and forth phone call to the ex? Could he have met them at a location? Right, and could he have done something nefarious? Because right. obviously, the police found something in that car that led them to make this poster right here. Right. Endangered missing advisory at risk missing person. So obviously uh, they found something that they didn't like. One of the things that I don't like is that they never list on this poster anywhere Veronica Butler's car. What kind of car is it? I heard it was SUV, but they never list it. They never tell you what the plate number is there. What if some people saw that car traveling somewhere and they weren't driving it? So all of that is information that you could use the press and the public to help you with. I don't understand why they're not doing that. Instead, Kansas mom's missing in Oklahoma since 3-30-24. Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation suspects foul play. How does that help the community to help you uh, in regards to this? And maybe... The answer is, is that they know what direction they're going in in this investigation. They're going towards some a member of the family. Uh, Rebecca Morellis uh, became a YouTube member. Congratulations. Thank you for joining our YouTube family. 
Welcome. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much. I want to play Bobby Ciccone, who was just on my show the other night, retired FBI agent. He's one of the best and most experienced uh, talking heads out there that really knows his stuff. Let's hear what he had to say the other night on Dan Abrams. Yeah, former FBI Special Agent Bobby Chacon. All right, Bobby, we have limited information here, but based on what we do know, what are you seeing here? Well, I could be wrong, Dan, but it looks to me like an abduction. Now, the only question then becomes, is it abduction from somebody they know, or was this a random opportunity? Somebody saw two women traveling alone in a vehicle along a deserted stretch of road or a rural stretch of road, and it was an opportunity crime. But I would have done, an, I, I hope they did an exhaustive search surrounding the area where the vehicle was found with dogs and drones and whatever. Um, and then the standard investigation of talking to friends, family, coworkers, to see if either of them had a be for a dispute with somebody, either a, a, a personal or financial, um, and you're looking into the backgrounds of each of them um, to see uh, what it certainly looks like an abduction to me. It, one of the first things I think you'd want to know is were they having car trouble, for example, right? Meaning, did they stop and something happened or did they pull over? Um, I would think if they'd had car trouble, the police would have said that, right? Sure, and then why wouldn't one of them just get on the phone and call somebody? I think that I would also look to see if there's any damage in the car, because often when people want to get somebody to stop or pull over, get out of their vehicle, they they kind of come up with one of these fender bender things and, and to get them to stop and get out of their vehicle, and then the, the abduction takes place. So I would look very carefully at that car, whether there was any damage, even slight minor damage. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you have to really look carefully at that crime. That car is a crime scene right now. Was any of their personal belongings scattered around the car outside or, or something like that? And one of the other things that I still don't know, what we're going to hopefully find out, is that that there was a report that they were going to a supervised visit with one of the with the kids. I don't know exactly what that means, but that could be another potential thing to look into, right? Yeah, so, so of course, a supervised visit means that the that parent does not have you know custody of that child or to be alone with that child if yeah. it's a supervised visit. So you'd have to look into why that situation exists as well. Thank you for. So you know, in the chat, everyone's. Uh talking about the, um, that they they found blood in the car. Moonchild thought the dad was in rehab. Well, you know, we, some of these things that we hear, we, I don't know if that's confirmed. I had read that also. Uh, Lori Blythe, I think you're right, Bill. Uh, Sharon, Sharon creates, sharing Sharon creates. I, X was recently out of jail and was supposed to be to go to rehab. But you know something? Those rehabs are loose and fast, lots of them. Uh, I had a guy one time that had a ankle bracelet on, you know, uh, an ankle monitor, and he went out and did a shooting while he had an ankle bracelet on, shot five people. So don't, let's not take too much with that he was in rehab. You know, the rehab is, you know, you're filled with social workers usually. Uh, Laura Blythe, I'm guessing they found blood in the car. I don't know if that's confirmed, Lori, but that would make sense because, look, they locked down the school, right? Mm -hmm. And based on what they found in the car, they're saying that it, it now they suspect foul play. Margaret Hearn, how the ex-husband with a violent and multiple criminal charges was awarded partial custody is insane. Yeah, but apparently his mother has the full custody. Uh, ridiculous SC. They had already found the car and blood. All right, uh, ridiculous AC. I, I believe that, and I believe that's why they made this a uh, foul, foul play. They suspected foul play. But have you seen anywhere that the police confirmed that? I haven't seen that. I haven't even heard the news confirm that there was blood in the car. So I don't know. Is this is this yeah. a social media thing no. that people are just uh, saying this? But it would make sense ridiculous SC because they made it foul play as soon as they found the car. So yeah, that would make a hell of a lot of sense that that happened. But right now I can't, uh, ridiculous AC, all they are looking for are bodies now. Well, you know, that's, we can't 100% say that, but you know, something that's why rid ridiculous SC, I think that the police of the Oklahoma uh, Bureau state Bureau of investigation should reach out to the community. How else are they going to find these? You heard Bobby Chacon say, I hope they did an exhaustive search once they found that car with drones, dogs, mm -hmm. and uh, vehicles, helicopters perhaps, because if they didn't, that car is a crime scene. And one of the most important pieces of evidence on this
besides the car will be their cell phones. But unfortunately, that could take a while. And in a rural area like this, we're not going to get the same value of cell phone pings that we would get in an urban area where they can almost pinpoint uh, where the car was. And, you know, people are saying in the chat also that there is a uh, – no one will talk. There's a gag order. Yes, but why are the police doing that? And I'll tell you why. Because someone in the family is involved in this. I think – I'm convinced of that. Mike. Yeah, Billy, you know, with, uh, moms, you know, and dads d with children – they don't go missing just blindly like a single person who just wants to, you know, do something in their life. They don't have to worry about anybody that's footloose and fancy free. The moment you hear of a dad missing or a mom missing, or in this case, two moms missing, you know, that is alarm bells. That is absolute emergency right off the bat. You got to go full tilt on this case. Um, and uh, so, therefore, this is right off the bat. This is you got to suspect the worst, whatever, whatever happens to be. You got to suspect the worst. Um, I'm just thinking as we're talking and I'm just thinking more about it. Maybe, maybe the uh, the 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 uh, Miss Clark's, um, you know, uh, relationship to the school, perhaps they may may have thought that they're somewhere between where the car is. And her school, she maybe they wanted to. They may thought that she they, she would be somewhere there, either either hiding, being held. Maybe her body would be there. You know, recover type of recovery thing. Because if you're in the middle of nowhere, and the only thing that is familiar to you is a school, on a mile in the distance, maybe you're gonna go over there. Maybe if the car did break down, and you don't know, you don't have any cell service. Well, maybe if you know that there's a school because you went to it, you know, seven years ago, and that's the only building in like five miles, maybe because it was within the grid search pattern. Other than that, I'm not sure, but why they would do that. But they are not, it's strange. Maybe they are not looking to make a lot of announcements because they don't want to scare anybody in the, hus the ex husband's family. Uh, maybe they want to keep uh, the lines of communication open and they don't want to name a person of interest. But um, very different down there than it would be done here in New York City. You know, Mike, I'm thinking that uh, one of the reasons we're seeing this uh, this quietness, this, well, you know, the police can't impose a gag order. That right. has to be done by a judge. So they just requested that the family doesn't speak to the press. That's a request. There's no gag order unless a judge is issues it. And since there's no one under arrest or anything like that, I don't think a judge is going to issue a gag order. Okay. But I think that it, it, it's clear because they're not reaching out to all the places they could be reaching out to right now, i.e. the media, i.e. the public, the, their own public information office, putting out all kinds of information. I think... They have someone in mind. I think they have someone they're targeting. I think potentially it could be someone in that. It could be the ex-husband. So, you know, saying he was in rehab, as I, my experience as a New York City police officer, rehabs, you can walk in and out of there and no one's going to stop you. They're an absolute joke. So yeah. to say he was in rehab, you know, maybe it was part of his, even we know probation and parole, whatever, if he's under the supervision of the criminal justice system, Usually he can come and go as he pleases. So I would be looking at, at, at someone in that family. And apparently um, Veronica and the and the mother-in-law uh, had a, a sort of a bombastic relationship yeah. also. Yeah. So apparently people are saying that the husband had partial custody. I don't know. I haven't seen the family court orders. But... This is, you know, why did she have to bring along with her a uh, sort of a chaperone, uh, Jillian Kelly, who was part of her church, who came along with her? And uh, here's a better in the in the flyer for it. Did she, was this part of the court's requirement that Veronica, if she sees the kids, had to be accompanied by another adult? 
because what was Jillian Kelly doing with her? And she knew her from her church. This could be, you know, a double, double tragedy because of this. But I, I my gut is telling me that this is someone in uh, Veronica Butler's family that is involved in this. Not, it's not a stranger crime. And again, I could be wrong. And I, as I always say, I've been wrong before, but that's my gut. Mike? I kind of agree with you, Billy, on this one. And, and Ms. Kelly, I, I think just having come along to act as an, a, an aide to help uh, Ms. Butler and to be there just to you know, help supervise the kids at the party that they were going to take them to, uh, I, I fear that she was just totally meant well, was trying to do you know, a good deed as a good Christian, and here she is in the wrong place at the wrong time, and whatever evil had befallen Miss Butler, the person who did whatever they did to her probably was not, maybe not, was even, wasn't aware that Miss Kelly would be, even be there in the car. Um, because normally you, if you're going to do something, somebody you don't want to have another witness right there. Um, and she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But uh, yeah, this is some, somebody either within the family or very closely associated with that family um, may have been involved in this. I'd bet my paycheck. I, I think so too. Pierre, uh, it was a condition of release, but not clear if he showed they had to have a supervised visit. Mm -hmm. uh, Marilyn Hendricks, semi sharp. The car was found by Elkhart, uh, Kansas. Um, Pauline Buckles, maybe Jillian volunteered to go along as a good Samaritan from mm -hmm. her church. I think she did. I think that was uh, Martha and mine. A supervised visit was imposed by the court. Uh, Simi Sharp, my gut agrees with your gut, Bill. Well, thank you. Um, Veronica uh, was never married to the father of these children. Well, we call that in New York common law, child right. in common. That makes you basically married. You know, whether you went before a justice of the peace or a priest or ever, you have a child in common. You're basically, in the eyes of the law, you're basically married. Isn't that true, Mike? Yeah, there's no distinction really in terms of how the civil law treats you. If you're uh, cohabiting in a, uh, in a relationship for you know at least 30 days or more, everyone has rights to live in that home. If so, um, and if you have children in common, you have a common law marriage. That's it. The law does not really treat you any differently in any way, shape, or form. And so, therefore, yeah, we call it. We've always called it uh, common law marriage in the NYPD uh, for years. And um, I think different states have different rules about it, of course. But uh, we always talk about common law marriage because you see this all the time. And so, um, you know, the fact that they weren't officially had hadn't gone in front of a judge or just the peace, you know, that sort of thing. But as far as the law is concerned, they're, they're a family. They're, they're a family. Absolutely. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. If you like real crime, true crime from a police perspective, you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, ring that bell, share us with your friends, your family, neighbors, whoever you want to share us with. And if, uh, if you want to contribute to us, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And we also have a YouTube channel membership with count them five different levels. And our, our YouTube uh, Patreon is growing, and so is our uh, our YouTube channel membership. We appreciate it so much. Lizzie Herzberger, thank you so much for the 1999 super sticker. Lizzie Herzberger, if you guys don't know, she's the author of the book Behind the Green Curtain, uh, a story of Amish, uh, Amish families and what some of these young women have gone through growing up. I don't want to spell it out, but uh, it's an outstanding book. In fact, my co-host tonight, Mike Geary, read the book twice. I read it once. I read it all the way through. I know Lizzie about two or three years now, and I read it a couple of years ago. Great book. Lizzie, thank you so much. Um, back to the case. So we're thinking that, uh, again, this is, this is going to be – this is not going to end well. I'll, I'll put it that well. I, I don't see uh, a happy ending to this. And 
the the investigators you can bet they're looking at the 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 let's call him the common law husband or child and common dad you can bet that they're looking at him right now more about these two women veronica butler and jillian kelly who vanished in oklahoma over the weekend investigators calling the disappearance of these moms from kansas suspicious butler's family revealing on social media the two were traveling to oklahoma to pick up butler's kids there may have been a custody dispute involved we're also learning but their car was found abandoned near yarborough school where butler had graduated back in 2015. so that school was on lockdown yesterday and will limit visitation lock classroom doors today uh, just out of, of, of abundance of caution stephanie haynes is the latest for us here stephanie why aren't we hearing more from the families right now yeah, Marky, good morning. You know, we have a News Nation team on the ground there who's been speaking to people who identify as family, and one of them telling us, hey, listen, uh, we've been requested to just hold off on media interviews for now until police say it's okay. But we're still gathering a lot of information, including this new video of where this car was found abandoned. This is where it was last seen here in this very rural area of Oklahoma, uh, Highway 95 and Road L in Texas County. That's bordering the Texas panhandle and the border with Kansas. You can see there is absolutely nothing around. It's so strange. Eva, Oklahoma is the town where they were headed to to reportedly pick up Butler's kids. The car the two were in was found abandoned not far from the high school Butler graduated from. And that's what prompted administration there to go on a lockdown status earlier in the week with extra security measures in place because there are so many unanswered questions. That's according to the administration. Both mothers are from Hugoton, Kansas. That's about 50 miles away from their intended destination. And our News Nation station in Kansas reports Kelly is a mother of four and she is a secretary at her church where her husband is a minister and she runs all the children's programs programs there. And then a friend of Butler's spoke with our station as well, saying that Butler is kind and she's good with kids and she loves gardening, baking and cooking. And then the churches that these women were involved with have hosted prayer vigils, community events, just to try to um, keep these women at the top of mind, because there's a lot of people in the community who are on edge, understandably, about this. Marky. Thanks for So. There's, there's one of the answers. Jillian Kelly worked for her husband at his church, and she was probably accompanying uh, her to the, you know, uh, Veronica Butler to the location as, you know, sort of a good Samaritan type thing to help her out. And uh, the, this is the picture I put up before. That's um, Jillian Kelly's family. And her husband, obviously, in the middle there. Just, you know, a, a tremendously tragic situation. And um, in these situations, um, we frequently don't, uh, I hate to be, you know, pessimistic, but these situations typically don't end well, Mike. Uh, and, you know, yeah. where are these women? You know, that's the thing. And I think... I really do think that the police are targeting a specific person or persons because just, the, the, you know, this poster, endangered missing advisory at risk missing persons. What they found in that car uh, led them to put that out there, at risk missing persons. So they found something and hopefully, you know, the car is a crime scene. Of course, you would dust it for fingerprints, mm -hmm. swab it for DNA. They would check the computer to see where the car was, where it stopped off. You know, many cars have those computers that are built in GPS devices. And that might tell the story along with hopefully the cell phones. And that could provide, but again, cell, cell phone information it's not like television. It doesn't come back in 24 hours. It takes a while to get that information. Yeah, Billy, you've got uh, a, a, a mom of four and a mom of two, and they've gone missing. You know, um, this isn't any like anything you, you normally never see and you normally would ever see. And trying to figure out what are the possible 
you know, ways that this ends up in, in, a, in a happy return, um, it's very difficult. Um, you have to be, uh, uh, you, me, and Phil, we have to be realists about this. And we have to say what, and I always, always tell my students when we're doing criminal law, when, you know, when you think about something like this, what would possibly be the most, you know, normal, common sense answer, realistic answer to this issue? Um, it's not a Martian came down with a ray gun and took them away to outer space. No, it's something that we see every day in America, every day that we deal with these sorts of things. And we, we kind of are thinking that along the same lines, this is somebody really, really close, not some stranger that just came out of nowhere at like a bolt of lightning and struck these girls. No, this is something that evil that has befallen them was real close to them the whole entire time. And it's not probably a stranger. I bet my paycheck. And um, we just hope that, uh, you know, we could find them for their families. So the families may have some sort of closure. You know? It's horrible to think like that, but uh, unfortunately we've seen this so many times. Marilyn Hendricks, Sergeant Bill, I agree with you. I think her ex, uh, family's behind this. I live in Southeast Colorado, about one hour from Elkhart, Kansas, one and a half hours from Yugaton, Kansas, pronunciation Yugaton. And yeah, I, I think I just have a bad feeling that that's the, um, that's the case here, you know. Rogerio Brito, either something happened to the car and someone very evil took the ladies or someone from the family planned everything very well. Rogeria, yeah. I'm thinking uh, not A, I'm thinking B. Like someone in that family set this up. That's what I'm thinking because um, I think that the chances of a stranger abduction here with all the other stuff going on behind the scenes uh, doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. Mike? Yeah, Billy. I don't see. Could it happen? Yes. Is there a possibility? Yes. Obviously, there's always those sorts of possibilities. And those sorts of things have happened on occasion. But I, I got to go with what my gut instinct and what your gut instinct is and what Phil's would be the same thing. And that gut instinct isn't just based on, you know, uh, we just flip a coin. It's based on, you know, I've done this 20 years. Phil did this over 20 years. You did this at least 27 years, you know, and we come up with these hypotheses about what happened, you know, not based on, you know, just, you know, how many angels, philosophical questions, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin but what we've actually seen and done in terms of investigations in New York City. And so that's why we think about this case the way we think about it. And the ideas that we at, we're at right now are based on, you know, how we relate this to previous cases that we've seen in terms of missing persons. Yeah. Absolutely. Watson's puzzle. I'm afraid it's about Veronica's kids. Someone doesn't want uh, Veronica to have them. Obviously, they, there's a custody battle. Do custody battles sometimes end in violence? Unfortunately, yes. And, you know, do family court judges make wrong decisions on who to give the children to? Yeah. While yet still today, what Professor Geary said is what was found to be the case with Roden family massacre back seven to eight years ago. One baby's dad and his family killed. How many people was it? I think eight. Oy. Well, we see these things happening throughout the country. Uh, Watson's puzzle, I'd go with the X first. If it's him, it's a nightmare to take Jillian, too. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Electric, uh, Ron, I'm a street guy. Strangers don't attack two grown women in broad as daylight. It just doesn't happen. They knew their attacker. Mr. Electric, that's what we're trying to say. We're trying to say that we believe. And we don't know. This is gut. This is gut feeling and some of the evidence that we're hearing right now. Margaret Hearn, I want to believe OSBI using drones with infrared to search for recent land disturbance in case they were taken and buried. Yeah, I mean, that's what Bobby Chacon said, is that we got to check, do a full-scale search of the ground with drones and uh, with dogs. The belongings are still 
vehicle, but it doesn't sound like they know if the women have their belongings on them. In a social media post, a family member said that the last ping of Veronica's phone was where that car was. OSBI wouldn't confirm or deny that. But, you know, I wanted to know, was the car out of gas? Did it have tires that, you know, had been slashed? What, what would have caused these women to leave? And it doesn't seem like any of that was the case because he said they were trying to figure out why they would have left the vehicle. Very, very strange. Do we know, I mean, much more about these women? Were they longtime friends? I mean, there's a, there's a bit of an age difference. I think it's about 12 years between the two of them. I mean, uh, what do we know about them and their relationship? You know, we don't know a ton. We do know that the Veronica and Jillian were friends. How good of friends they were is a little bit of a mystery as well. Determining what their relationship is is something investigators are looking into. Is one of the first things they were trying to figure out. So we know they are friends. We know that Jillian, they're from the same area. They live in the same area. Jillian's husband is a preacher and that she was helping Veronica with this ride to apparently go either visit her children or pick up her children. What they were doing there is unclear, but we know, Brian, that they did not get to their destination. Do we know anything about their significant others, Caitlin? You know, it's interesting. That is one of the first questions I asked investigators. And they said that they're looking into, of course, the, everyone. They're looking into all of their friends and family, everyone who is close with them. But of course, I wanted to know, are you looking at significant others or perhaps, perhaps exes? But we don't know anything about that other than the fact that Jillian's husband is a preacher. And so, of course, we know his name and who he is. And they're all sharing these missing persons um, flyers trying to get more information about their whereabouts. But aside from that, who investigators are looking into, it seems like it's everyone at this moment. No, it's it's not everyone. It's it's I think they specifically have someone targeted. I mean, of course, part of a victimology uh, is that they study the background of the victim. And right away, what's going to hit you and slap you across the face is, is that Veronica is involved in a custody dispute. Right. That is what's going to pour cold water right in your face, shoot it right in your face, and it's going to wake you up. So now let's look. Who's she having the dispute with? One, her former mother-in-law or the baby daddy, as we call it in New York City, mother, uh, and then you got to look at the baby daddy because you guys in Oklahoma don't want me to call him a common law husband, but that's what I would call him. So that's what law enforcement is targeting. Believe me, trust me, that is who they are looking at. Uh, they're not looking at everyone. They're, they're, it's been five days now. They're narrowing this down. They are looking at someone specifically. When they find the car and right away they say there's foul play by looking at the car, I don't see this as a stranger abduction. I really don't see it as that. Mike. Yeah, Philly, it's, um, you know, you got to just go with realistically what is probably the case. And uh, they, the police will always say they're turning over every stone. They're investigating everybody. We're going to have to, everybody's a suspect because they want the families to know that they're doing the best they can. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, phrases to use to comfort them and they are looking at people and they will start interviewing people and within a few hours they're going to by the time they get to hear about the from other from people if they don't know it immediately by the time they get to hear about the ex and about child custody you're right that's a smack in the head because that's like okay okay because it takes a lot to want to hurt somebody to want to kill somebody you have to have something called anger or motive. You have to have motive. And what's the motive? The motive is to get that person out of that, out of your life. And so um, people don't kill. Uh, people are not irrational. They kill for a reason. They hurt people for a reason. They rob for a reason. They burglarize houses for a reason. They do things for a reason. And so um, the fact that these ladies are missing um, we, we believe that they've met a, a sad ending. And the reason for that would be, OK, there's got to be a really important reason. What's the really important reason in the victimology, looking at what has been going on in that in, in Miss Butler's life for the past six months, a year, whatever it happens to be, what has been a constant in her life? And we see we look and we see the X 
and uh, the the baby the baby's father, you know, sort of thing. And um, you, if you're not looking at that as the most prime suspect, the most, the, you know, then you're not doing your job. Of course, you're going to keep looking and looking and looking, but you, there's nothing to say that you can't look at other people while you're focusing on one person in particular. And perhaps I'm thinking in this case, you know, they might be really figuring out what's going on, but they might not announce anything for several weeks until they get the cell phone information. That stuff takes at least a month sometimes, maybe two months in some cases. So, so long as they have someone in their sights and they're not a flight risk, the police can just wait until they get all their ducks lined up in a row and then make an arrest in this sort of case. But if people don't hear a lot from the police in the future and they're not hearing any a lot right now, it doesn't mean that they don't know what they're doing or they don't have a clue. It means that they probably are just waiting for tests to come back, you know, evidence to come back, blood evidence, DNA evidence, fingerprint evidence, you know, ballistic evidence, uh, cell phone evidence, and they'll make their arrest when they have everything all set and ready to go. In the custody, M.B. Burke, in the custody case, drugs, I'm interested in hearing in, if, and how do the two ladies know each other? The two ladies know each other from church. Uh, Jillian Kelly is the pastor's wife, and apparently Veronica goes to that same church, and it looks like Jillian Kelly was being a good Samaritan and helping her, and she got involved in this. Uh, Simon K., no, I refuse to say they've met a sit any. No way. We need hope. They've run away to take a break from everything. Kids, church, custody cases. Simon K., I would love to believe that, too, and I hope you're right. You know, I really do hope you're right. Uh, it's, you know, it's not, you can't just wish things away and wish this. Yeah, we can pray and hope that they're alive and nothing bad befell them, but experience in this type of situation. But the police didn't say that there was foul play by finding the car, uh, because they like to just give themselves talk. They found something in that car that led them to say that. Uh, Rogerio, Rogerio Brito, I feel terribly sorry for both ladies, but the pastor's wife had nothing to do with that. Wow. No, you, she didn't. She was uh, potentially, and again, we don't know, but she was potentially in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, and that's typically the case. Um, but, you know, you have to wonder. I was listening carefully to your interview with police. You have to wonder if they know more right now because it, they're really not sharing very much and something does seem strange uh, the car, like, was it just abandoned? It was just basically abandoned on the side of the road. Is is that? That's is exactly that it? right. It was abandoned on the side of the road. The road, the state the car was in, we have no idea. I wanted to know were the doors open? Was the car running? Did it have gas in it? He really couldn't tell me anything, but he did give me a little bit of information that we had not previously learned. We don't know the make or model of the car, but I was told that it was a small blue SUV. So they're looking for tips mm. from anyone so this is a really rural area there is nothing around they don't have surveillance footage cctv footage eyewitnesses neighbors businesses the things that investigators usually rely on they really don't have so anyone in this area that saw a small blue suv that day is really encouraged to call with any information they have brian you know as well as i do you may not think what you know is important but it may be crucial yeah, of course. One thing I noticed on the missing poster, I was looking at it earlier, says to call police or tribal authorities. I'm assuming, does that mean, is that because there's like an Indian reservation nearby? Yeah, there's reservation lands that are nearby. Whether or not the car was abandoned specifically on one is something that they wouldn't confirm. But OSBI did say that multiple, multiple law enforcement agencies are all working on this. So the reservation authorities, as well as local PD and the OSBI are all kind of working to find these women. But he did also mention that the tips have been rolling in as soon as they kind of went public with this missing persons case. And he said, in no uncertain terms, they believe these women are in danger right now. So if you know anything, saw anything, think you know anything, call them, call in a tip, get a hold of law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it certainly uh, doesn't sound good. Let's hope for a positive outcome. We'll, we'll... So it's, um, that's, that's where it's coming from. You know, right now, they don't have 
uh, at least they're not releasing leads to us that they're telling us that they have a person of interest. But what they did tell us, which should give us all pause, is that they suspect foul play. And that was based on what they found in the car. And this is what, as a result of what they found in the car, they put out this at-risk missing persons, endangered missing advisory. I mean, that that's pretty clear. I think it's it says a lot about where the investigation is, where it's going, and what they found inside that car. Uh, some of the other things, how about the... And again, this is a, a rural area. Do they have red light cameras? Do they have uh, plate readers that would have seen the car perhaps at a certain location at a certain time? All of these are investigative type leads that the police potentially could have that we don't know about. Yeah, Billy, anything, anything, a bit of security footage from a convenience store that may have been five miles down the road, you know, that captured um, the two ladies, Butler and Kelly, driving by at, say, a particular time at 1.15 in the afternoon, their blue car, you know, and then a few minutes later, another car driving by, like, following them, just anything at all. You know, we're not used to working in that kind of rural environment. It's difficult for us to imagine how little, you know, evidence you're going to get from cameras and security footage and ring bell ring doorbell cameras and things like that you don't have it out there but anything at all would would be it would be a great help to just give the police you know more objective evidence to go on um and uh and you just hope like they said about the ping on the telephone that if there's if, if they can get a ping on kelly or butler's phone that means if anyone interacting with them had a cell phone, they would get pinging on that too. So you hope that when you do a cell tower uh, box grid search, electronic search, that maybe you can come up with something. And the one good thing about the ruralness in that area is that the, the, if in a big area like that, where there's not a lot of cell phones coming in and out uh, in the area where the cell tower is, however close the cell tower is, I don't know, um, it will probably be, you'll be able to narrow down the suspects even further because there's not going to be thousand people walking by like in New York City, Manhattan at any given time. It's going to be maybe just a several people uh, in that area. So um, it's going to take a while and it's going to we're all going to have to be patient. Um, but um, everybody should just keep their fingers crossed and uh, hope for the best. But be prepared for the worst. One hundred percent. Folks, if you're looking for a great attorney in the New York metropolitan area, then Joe Murray is your man. You can reach Joe on his cell phone at 718-514-3855. Email him at joe at jmurray-law.com. Go on his website, jmurray-law.com. Not only is Joe a fantastic defense attorney, but a huge supporter of the Police Off the Cuff podcast. So, so many investigative leads and so many investigative techniques the uh, investigators are using on this case and hopefully they do have a direction and by that we mean potentially you know you hear that term person of interest all the time but right. that's what we're hoping that they are on the right direction they are on the right path my brooke shaper joins us uh, live now from oklahoma she's out there all right first of all brooke what's the deal with this lockdown do we know how that's connected yeah i think brian that this was really out of an, ab an abundance of caution but it's really interesting here this is a school that's not too far from where this abandoned car was found it's also the school like you mentioned that veronica butler graduated from back in 2015 today the superintendent of that school district letting parents know that the school today was going to be on lockdown. He said, really, at this point, it's because there's still so many questions that we don't have answers to. So the school was on lockdown. Kids stayed inside all day. They had the doors locked. They brought in extra security as well. Again, I think this was really out of an abundance of caution, but it's because there's still so many.
I don't buy that abundance of caution nonsense. That word is ridiculous. Uh, they locked down a whole school out of an abundance of caution. No, no. They found something in that car that worries them, and that's why the school was locked down. Right. About the disappearance of these two moms. Something else interesting, Brooke, uh, none of the families are talking. Some of them are telling media that they were told not to talk. Police did not have a press conference today. There was really no official new information. We had to dig all that stuff up ourselves. Makes me wonder if there's yeah. some kind of movement behind the scenes, something they know. It does make you wonder. It certainly feels at this point like we are not getting the full picture from investigators right now um, as they continue to work behind the scenes trying to track down these two missing moms. Uh, there's definitely a lot of posts on social media, a lot of family members who are sharing these uh, the pictures of these two women uh, asking for any information. But I've reached out to a couple of them. And specifically, I spoke with a woman who said that she is Veronica's aunt. I talked to her on Facebook earlier today. And she said that they're not, or they were asked rather not to do any interviews until they get some permission from authorities down here. She even mentioned that there was a gag order on the case. But I think at this point, really, it's that family has kind of been asked to stay quiet as uh, investigators work on this behind the scenes. So well, again, just reading between the lines here, you've got two missing moms. You would think the police would want to get the word out and have everybody talking. So there's something we don't yeah. know. Just we only have about 10 seconds left, Brooke, but remind me again, whose kids were they going to pick up? What was that part of the story? Do you know? All right, if he doesn't know whose kids, I don't need to hear. We. <laughs> We know it was Veronica Butler's right. kids they were going to pick up, and uh, Miss Kelly was accompanying her. This uh, appears to be a, a tragic situation here, and uh, let's hope let's hope that the uh, Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation is on the right path and uh, has some good leads. And they treated that that vehicle once they found it as the most pristine crime scene that it really should be considered as. And that, to me, the key to this case is the car, which is the crime scene, and the cell phones of the victims. And even if they didn't find the cell phones, the carriers can get the cell phone information as per the pings on the cell phone, the incoming and outgoing calls. All of those things come into play in almost every investigation we cover in the true crime community on this show, Mike. Yeah, years, years ago, ago, you know, you, they, you wouldn't be even talking about cell phones or even in the early 2000s, but it's become, they're so ubiquitous and they are little GPS trackers for better, for worse. And in this kind of situation um, with these two young ladies, Clark and Kelly, um, that they may make all the difference between solving this crime and someone getting away with it. And so as much as they may, you know, we just think, oh, my God, okay, we got to get the cell phone information. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be a, very involved. It's going to cost a lot of money. But you know what? Uh, it can, in, like like the case with uh, Rex Sherman in New York, it can provide, you know, um, real, fabulous, um, excellent, you know, objective evidence uh, clearing someone or putting somebody, as Phil would say, in the box and uh, we need that sort of information because that may be the best information we're going to get and i think the police are doing probably a good job brian hinton's correct they're doing they're working behind the scenes they don't want anybody to shut up and clam up by maybe naming a person of interest they want to keep everybody willing to talk to them and to come to their aid and give them some information and so i think they're taking a, a gamble that that's the best way to go about this this particular case at this particular time so uh i'm just keeping my fingers crossed that uh they know what they're doing and that uh you know we'll see something and hear something and we'll get some information on this case when the time is appropriate and hopefully it'll be something uh substantive where we can say okay great now we know what has happened 100 percent. and you know as per her um you want to call him the baby daddy mm -hmm. apparently uh, uh a criminal history, uh, a drug history, how he has, I don't know the full story, how he has partial custody of his kids doesn't make any sense to me. Apparently, 
they gave custody to his mother. Uh, you know, one of the things people always ask the police is that, oh, why do you think because someone has a criminal history that they should be a suspect? Well, you know, past performance is pretty good indicator of future performance. That's all, all I'll say. And um, that's one of the reasons we look at that as being so meaningful. Um, Watson's puzzle. Poor sweethearts, the Anna Veronica seemed to have loved her niece so much. Good for her for keeping quiet for now. Uh, well, at some point, the police will be telling us something, hopefully, and at some point, the family members will probably want to speak out. But folks, we're going to be watching this case. We'll be following this case right now. Uh, Jillian Kelly, 39, Veronica Butler, 27, two Oklahoma mothers are missing under suspicious circumstances. And we hope and pray for their safe return. Uh, there is Jillian Kelly there with her family, four kids, a husband who's the pastor of the church that also Veronica Butler belongs to. So that's the connection between Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. Mike, uh, your, your final thoughts. Uh, final thoughts. I think that people should... Um just um, be, you know, just be patient. I always say that all the time, but just be patient and realize that the police probably have a good handle on this. They're not explaining things, why, what they're doing and why they're doing it. But, and that's a little frustrating and I feel your frustration too, but um, it's probably a good tactical move. And I, I don't think we should second guess them with that. And uh, I think they probably kind of understand at this point, what probably happened they're not working in the dark they probably know what happened they're figuring it out and they're just trying to you know get everything lined up uh, to make their move to make an arrest but uh it's probably going to be a, a very simple story when it's all said and done and it's going to be a very familiar story probably when it's all said and done so everybody keep the faith and uh, just be patient while yet still today at Karen Kennedy, yeah, there you go. That's how I should have worded my question, Ponjing, here in chat earlier. You said it succinctly. Thank you. And hello, I arrived late tonight and in frequent attending. That's okay. Uh, we appreciate you showing up uh, at all. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, this is a, a, a tragic case uh, right now. Uh, Watson's puzzle, I think we'll see an arrest sooner than we think. Well, let's hope that. Let, let's hope. Uh, Priscilla Shira, thank you, Bill, for your coverage of the story. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Simi Sharp, uh, Tiff, uh, I, I don't know what some of these little abbreviations mean, but uh, guys, I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. Have a great rest of your night. And God bless everyone. Good night. One episode, just saying enough.